It's like as long as you put in the work and you put in the time, you shouldn't be surprised whenever that good luck rears its head. Yeah. But if the the good luck isn't evident in its rear in its head rearing, we go back to Galatians six nine, mm-hmm. and we trust the process because eventually, if we don't give up, that goodness, that good luck will rear its head. Yeah. No, I mean, it, and. I think it's it's important to remember, like, the only way to fail is to quit. That's it. Or to not try. Yeah, or to not try, yeah. The champion mindset. And yeah. that's why people couldn't stand Michael Jordan. Because they yeah. were like, they, they're like, bro, we can't be you. And he's like, well, I don't care. Try your hardest to be the best you. Not only is change needed, listen, change is inevitable. It's inevitable. Mm-hmm. You recently created a miniseries, Elevator Money. Yeah. Savage. I, I wish I could have went to the premiere. I couldn't go, but I really wish I could have went. Seeing again the communal aspect of somebody in Kansas City creating something as high quality product as what it was goes beyond just the communal aspect of being able to create something f- not only for the community but with the community. You had a like my boy Donnie was in there. Like there's yeah. people in there that I was uh do from the radio that does the podcast with um yeah yeah Alex Harris. Joe Joe Cornejo. Uh, Joe Cornejo, you know what I'm saying? Like there was people there were familiar faces in there and it's dope to see. But again, like f- imagine yourself as a younger Isai at that premiere Knowing that the Tom Cruise who's on the TV is right there presenting it, he's a local person, there's an easier ease of access to that what you once were idolizing and now finally being able to humanize those people because you're at that level yeah. that you're able to give to people in Kansas City, the younger people, especially the younger creative heads, someone like you or I back in the day, seeing someone like you from their town reach that same level. Yeah. No, I mean, that that's that was even evident because like, there was high schoolers that came in the premiere man. and you know, we were taking pictures and they were like, man, like you really inspired me. Um, you know, I didn't know like anyone was doing this in KC. Man. Um, and just like, it's different when you like, maybe someone comments or sends you a DM, right? but seeing them in person and like seeing like how excited or just like how blown away they are. Mm-hmm. It's like, that's going to leave a, a lasting impression on what they think is possible. So I was like, we're doing something right. You know, I think, doing it here and, and really my idea with the miniseries was I wanted to make it um not like f- in Kansas City but like for Kansas City right you know like I wanted right. it to feel like people from all over the city could relate to it whether it was a familiar face mm-hmm. whether it was a familiar brand like Maid Mob right um or like Casey Kitchen um even like locations I was gonna say with certain location scenes settings yeah. like oh that's West Bottoms that's this that's that you yeah know what I mean yeah like that's what I really wanted to kind of encapsulate with it um and, and I think we did that pretty well with the miniseries and I'm excited to see where it goes and the goal with that is to make it into a feature film right you're going out to New York right I mean uh LA right yeah yeah that's right yeah nice. we'll be at the American film market for a week pitching it to a bunch of different studios investors like everyone that was willing to hear us so we're going to pitch that. And then the goal is to bring it back here, um, get an actual good budget for it right. and and see where it goes, man. But yeah. The fact that you as a local native are able to be, are able to make that ease of transition from idolizing to then being able to humanize, like you being able to do that for the younger generation or, I mean, it doesn't have to be the younger generation. It's for the people in town, the people locally who don't realize the sort of, achievements that are possible like when i made the podcast at first people were like bro that looks professional like oh my goodness like that sounds good it looks good and all this stuff and i'm like dude i'm doing it all by myself right and i'm like you know i'm doing it with two cameras that aren't supposed to be recording long format like this like they may not see what's happening behind the scenes but the final product speaks for itself Mm -hmm. the again the turnout the showing all of that like superficially you can see it's evident how successful it was but internally, is there something that you like, is this project anything like anything you've ever done before? Or is, was this a unique experience, both in the creation of it on that journey and when it was all finally said and done? Mm, that's a good question. Um, honestly, this is probably the most engulfed I've ever been in a project. Like I've never had this amount of focus and determination to complete something because uh, this was at like at the time the biggest thing at scale that I had done um you know we had over 40 people on set on some mm. days we had um department heads we had people in wardrobe makeup um art department we had people uh coming in from out of town to do some stuff some days were so, you in charge of all this 
Yeah. So <clears throat> I was, I directed it and I acted in it. Um, so I kind of played that role. So I was really more on the creative side, okay. making sure we were um, getting what we needed. But also I knew I couldn't do it by myself. So I needed to find some good producers and right hand people I could rely on. Nice. And those people were Josiah Tomley. Um, he's a good friend of mine. We had worked on like smaller projects together and I knew like he was a problem solver. And even if he didn't have a ton of experience, well, neither of us had a ton of experience narrative in narrative um, projects. We've done commercial documentary, um, like, uh, I guess like social media content, but that's a different animal than like actually having, you know, six to 12 pages to shoot in one day, right. having um, different setups, like it's a completely different workflow. So I knew that I could rely on him for one, but also he was a problem solver. So if we had a problem, he was going to figure out a way to, to solve it and not kind of uh, make a big deal out of stuff. So <clears throat> Josiah was one person that we really, uh, I really relied on and then cloud. And then we kind of like, I assembled a team around like even camera department, Alex McLaren was our a cinematographer and, uh, Craig Richard was our, um, our assistant camera operator. So he was, they were in charge of camera department lighting. Um, you know, we had people coming in and out cause it was a volunteer or like really low paying job. So, I was just calling them favors. I was right. asking people to, Hey, like I'm working on this. Would you be willing to give a night of your, of your week to work on it? And some people could do it. Some people couldn't, some people would go for half the time, but it was really just getting creative and seeing who I had in my network that could, for one, <clears throat> I could afford to have them be a pro- part mm-hmm. of the project. And then for two, um, were they someone that was, I guess, coachable or easy to work with, you know, cause I could have got or paid more for more experienced people, but I kind of wanted to give the opportunity to like people that I was coming up with, Nice, you know, Mm -hmm. um, that goes back to, again, the reason why, or the essence behind it being such a communal project. Yeah. A hundred percent. Like it was, it was something where we all were ready to learn from and we knew we were going to have hiccups. It wasn't something that we were surprised when we had a pivot. Mm -hmm. Um, but it made it a lot more special throughout the process. Cause then it's like, we did this, you know, like right. this was a huge task that we had to accomplish. And on paper, we're not the most experienced in this field, but we killed it and right. we did it. And now we can do it again. Um, but yeah, it really came down to knowing who to get in the right roles, you know, right. and who to give a shot to and who maybe someone that if it was a really, really important role, okay, I'll, I'll break a little bit more bread, make sure we have someone that is more experienced or can actually if shit hits the fan can, can know how to maneuver it. But luckily with elevator money, you know, as long as we had our department heads, we were also able to give a lot of even younger filmmakers opportunities, people that maybe it was their first time working in lighting or working in art department or working on set at all. We had first time production assistants that it was their first set they had ever been on. And for them to come to a set that was you know, well-organized, um, a lot of people on set, it, it was a fun experience for them. And for all of us, you know, it was like, okay, we're, we're coming together as a team to do this, you know, but, but yeah, like growing up to kind of answer your question, I didn't really know exactly how it would work, but I knew, you know, in different parts of my life when I left college, you know, I was like, all right, I need to make money. I can start shooting weddings. Right. And I was strategic. All right, let's go find like, you know, people to shoot weddings for a wedding company. I started working for them and it's all right. Like, okay, I made some money doing that. Okay. Like what if I put this money for this gear, then maybe I'll get booked for more like commercial shoots where they're like, they're wanting this type of equipment or these type of, um, skilled, um, DPs or whatever. So I kind of like was very strategic in moments in my life and doing research and being like, okay, this is the next step. Um, and I think if I wouldn't have done that, it would have been easy to get lost or frustrated. Um, so it definitely is one of those things where you look up and it's like, oh shit, like how did I get here? But then you think about it, it's like, oh no, I was very strategic along the way. You're a genius because the name, the name of the game that I tell, I tell every single person I come across, especially my clients, but this is something I live by. It's my favorite mathematical formula. Preparation plus opportunity equals luck. You yeah. ever heard that quote? Mm-hmm. Seneca was the first, I think, person to actually say something to that capacity. But prepar- preparation plus opportunity equals luck. And so the more prepared you are, when any opportunity comes, you increase the probability of luck. And so when you have your head down, all you're doing is proverbially preparing, developing those skills to where when the opportunity comes for you to shoot a wedding, for you to shoot a uh, commercial, for you to shoot anything, 
you've been preparing. So now the opportunity comes. I think it's safe to say that's why you're not surprised that you've had such good luck. Mm. Yeah. That, yeah. Go ahead. No, I mean, that's, that's, that's a great way to put that. I never looked at it that way. Yeah. I, I guess it, it wasn't surprising to get the opportunity. Cause it's like, when you put, and you know this as a content creator and doing this for so long, like when you're putting in the hours, it gives you a con, like a, a certain amount of confidence. <laughs> it's like, I know like I'm outworking other people that, or I have more experience in just the amount of hours and reps I've put into something. So when the opportunity comes, it's not surprising. You know, if you, if, if, um, story blocks hit you up and say, Hey, we want to give you a $2,000 partnership. You're not going to be surprised. Like, okay, bet it's, you know, I've been doing this for three years. Right. Like it's about time. Okay, bet let's, let's do it. Um, but it is different once you start making money, though. That's one oh, thing sure. where you're like, whoa, like, this is crazy. You start actually like, oh, yeah, man, I can make a living off of this. I can pay rent off of this. Like, dude, when I first started talking to people and doing consultations, that for me was like, I do this. I do this with my girlfriend. Like, I do this with my brother. Like, I'm just having a conversation with you that somebody should have with you. Yeah. And the fact that you can then take a skill in a niche domain as talking or editing a video or even producing and shooting the video. It's like as long as you put in the work and you put in the time. You shouldn't be surprised whenever that good luck rears its head. Yeah. But if the the good luck isn't evident in its rear in its head rearing, we go back to Galatians 6 9 mm-hmm. and we trust the process because eventually, if we don't give up, that goodness, that good luck will rear its head. Yeah. No, I mean it, and I think it's it's important to remember like the only way to fail is to quit. That's it. Or to not try. Yeah, or to not try. Yeah. yeah. Do you know who John Wooden is? Yes. Okay, you're genius. Yeah. John Wood, uh, John Wooden, national NCAA, one of the best basketball coaches of all time at UCLA. He had Lou Alcindor, who's also known as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and he also had Bill Walton, Luke Walton's dad. Um, won, I think, seven titles straight, 10 total, but seven straight in the crazy. NCAA basketball. It's crazy for UCLA. John Wooden, I have somewhere on there. His books are up there somewhere. Um, Yeah, they're somewhere on there. Oh, see that one right there next to the Buddha book? It says by Brave New World. It says Wooden on Leadership. Right here? Yeah. See, it says Wooden on Leadership. Yep. Yeah. So that book right there. Yeah. That book right there is. I used to read that when I was a freshman in high school and when I was going into my sophomore year. Uh-huh. And John Wooden talks about he would literally tell his team. And I had a coach in high school. His name was Fred Turner, Missouri Hall of Fame coach, one of the best high school coaches in basketball in Missouri. And he followed a lot of John Wooden's principles. But John Wooden said something that Coach Turner always said and behaved and acted by, which is if you are trying to the best of your ability with no excuses underlying it, then that in and of itself makes you successful. And we can lose this game by 50. But if we tried our hardest in practice and in preparation for this game and we lost by 50 just because the other team was 50 points better, we're leaving happy as if we won by 50. Because we got out of the or we got the result out of the action that was incumbent and dependent on our initial efforts or that preparation. Mm. So if we have bad luck, let's say we have to question and reassess what our preparation looked like. Yeah. And that was the essence of John Wooden's entire philosophy is success is defined by peace of mind attained only through self-satisfaction and knowing you made the effort to do the best of which you're capable. Fire. Fire. You feel me? That's crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, it's dope. You have a lot of these. I mean, dude. None of this would even make sense if you weren't and the success wouldn't even be where it's at in your life if you weren't embodying a lot of these ideas and principles fundamentally from the biblical sense, from the from uh, the integrity of how you lead yourself, let alone other people. Mm -hmm. And then you get to a point where you literally have 40 people on set one day. You're technically in charge of everything. Because you gave all these people the opportunities and you allowed all these people to be here as a result of your creative endeavors. And now, because of that, you're able to (laughs) forever have the feeling of looking on screen, having 250 plus people watch you on screen and see that genius manifest into what it now currently is and will forever be for the test of time. Yeah. No, bro. That's that's an epic way to wrap that up. That was. Oh, yeah, brother. It's dope, man. Hell epic, man. (laughs) Um, Bro, are you a motivational speaker? Nah, but like that's something that kind of goes with. What like it's the quality of being able to motivationally speak underlies what I do with people in my consultation meetings. Like when uh, I consult people, it's essentially me talking that talking to them in the same manner of realist of of realistic truth living, because I wouldn't criticize and be so harshly critical of the world if I wasn't that way towards myself. Yeah. 
Yeah, so am I a motivational speaker? I was trying to before COVID hit. I had a couple things lined up. But you could definitely do it, bro. COVID kind of fucked with it. Bro, you could you're one like rollout or like like brand push away. You could definitely do it. I appreciate that, bro. bro. I appreciate that. I I think there's a lot of this being the first time we've ever even really like linked up, ever embarked on something creative, collaborative, collaborative, create creatively collaborative. I'm trying yeah. to find a way to say that. I just want to say two C's and have an alliteration, right? I just try to sound cool. <laughs> right. But to be creatively collaborative, today being the first day that we've embarked on that, like... Yeah, bro. I, I got to say, like, when I saw you and the consistency and the amount of, of time you're putting into it, I was proud, bro. I was like, damn, that's, do- that's so dope, you know? Hell yeah. I know it's not easy. I know, I know there's a lot of doubt. There's a lot of things that can come up and you've pushed through all of that. You're like, nah, I'm going to do this. Even if it's off my iPhone, I'm going to find a way. You're so, a genius. Yeah. So bro, I was like, yeah, like I had to reach out to you and give you a, give you your flowers. Hell yeah, bro. I appreciate dope, that. Man. And now that we're in this new studio, bro, man. like, look at you, man. <laughs> full look circle. <laughs> I, bro, full circle. It's, it's, I'm not surprised by any of this. Just like you're not surprised when you see yourself on camera with 250 plus people watching. Like, dude, I, as a creative head, can only imagine the true level of fulfillment you got, not only, again, from the superficial professionalism of the product, but the underlying communal essence that founded the product in the first place. Like you having the, I not only did this for me, because low key as a creative head, that's always like, that's our baby. Like that's our creative child. It's, again, I talk about this in the book. Yeah. It's you have parents and you have creators. And throughout all of human history, that's what separates us from the animal kingdom. The only way other animals could thrive and survive f- and with respect to allowing themselves to live on was through their direct descendants, was through their offspring, was through the progeneration of a new generation. Humans have the ability, like Leonardo da Vinci and all these other motherfuckers, to create something and then it lasts the test of time. And their essence lives on through their creation. Mm. So even if they don't have or if we're not if we're not privy to the direct descendants of their genius, we're still privy to their genius because of how it's lasted through their creative efforts, through their work. Yeah. And so it's like, dude, selfishly, we always take a step back and like, yeah, I created it. That's my baby. Yeah. And we wouldn't create it if we didn't have faith that it was worthy of creating in the first place. Yeah. But when it's underlined with that communal, when it's underlined with it being something more than you, again, something biblical, when it's more than you and it's the essence of all those involved, I'm sure you get hit by a bus tomorrow and be fine. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I always tell people. It's like, my life's going good. I get hit by a bus tomorrow and I'm good. Yeah. No, big fact, bro. Yeah. You, you definitely you hit it right on the head, man. That's that's so true. Thanks for watching that clip. This episode is brought to you by Manscaped.com. Support for self-sustained training is brought to you by the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Manscaped just launched their fourth-generation trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. You heard that right, the 4.0. Join the 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off and free shipping worldwide with code SST at manscaped.com. Yeah, shout out to Manscaped, man. They were nice enough to send us this performance package 4.0, which is their luxury grooming kit. And it comes with the Lawnmower 4.0 electric trimmer, the weed whacker for your ear and your nose hairs, and then all your post shave performance essentials in the deodorant and the toner. Plus, they give you an anti-chafing boxer, which is super comfortable. Super comfortable. And then they top off the performance package with a nice little travel bag so you can carry all of your grooming tools with you. And you can get 20% off and free shipping with code SST at manscaped.com. That's 20% off using code SST at manscaped.com. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools with the job using Manscaped.